footsteps behind you as you enter the woods. Night draws back its cape. Night illumines your path. Open your eyes. Listen. Welcome to Dark Softly Tales. Dark stories for dark hearts. I'm Mav Sky. Good evening and welcome to your nightmares and another episode of your favorite storytelling podcast, Dark Softly Tales. I'm your host, Mav, and I will be reading part three of Robert E. Howard's Pigeons from Hell. Is it me or does this sound like the beginning of an infomercial? I'm not going to read you an infomercial because that would be dumb. Just keeping it real here at Dark Softly Tales, and let's keep going with the flow. Is it me, or do you find the flock of pigeons roosting on the porch disturbing, especially when they flutter up into the red glow of the sunset? The old voodoo priest in the story tells us his explanation, which we won't discuss because you haven't heard it yet, but it does go hand in hand with doves being messengers from this world into the next. Doves or pigeons are usually portrayed as symbols of peace, luck, and good fortune. So I think when you have the gentle innocence of these birds perching like gargoyles on the old plantation farmhouse, rising up into the red glare hell of a sunset, there isn't much that can top that grim vision. I wonder if there is more to the symbology of these pigeons than what the voodoo priest tells us. Growing up, Howard's home life was turbulent. His parents argued constantly and eventually split. This was devastating to Howard, and he spent most of his time dreaming up stories and clicking away on a typewriter. He remained close to both parents as he grew older, but like a dark voodoo spell, they seemed to have a power hold over him that he never quite broke free from. There was this constant internal struggle within him, And it was from this struggle where the adventurous pulp stories were born, and of course, the horror stories of dark versus light. When Howard ended his own life shortly after his mother died, it didn't seem to be a surprise to anyone. In light of that knowledge, I think the symbology of the pigeons mean more than just souls or messengers from this world into the next. I think they represented innocence destroyed by hate and vengeance. They marked the plantation farmhouse like tombstones mark a grave. Speaking of graves, let's get to our story, shall we? Take my hand and hang on tight as we journey into the dark softly. Chapter 2 The Snake's Brother Again, the shadows were lengthening over the pine lands, and again, two men came bumping along the road in a car with a New England license plate. Buckner was driving. Griswell's nerves were too shattered for him to trust himself at the wheel. He looked gaunt and haggard, and his face was still pallid. The strain of the day spent at the county seat was added to the horror that he still rode his soul like the shadow of a black-winged vulture. He had not slept, had not tasted what he had eaten. "'I told you I'd tell you about the Blassenfields,' said Buckner. "'They were proud folks, haughty, and pretty damn ruthless when they wanted their way. They didn't treat their slaves as well as the other planters did.' got their ideas in the West Indies, I reckon. There was a streak of cruelty in them, especially Miss Celia, the last one of the family to come to these parts. That was long after the slaves had been freed, for she used to whip her mulatta maid, just like she was a slave, the old folks say. The Negroes say, when a Blassenville died, the devil was always waiting for him out in the Black Pines. Well, 
after the Civil War, they died off pretty fast, living in poverty on the plantation, which was allowed to go to ruin. Finally, only four girls were left, sisters, living in the old house and eking out a bare living, with a few blacks living in the old slave huts and working the fields on the share. They kept to themselves, being proud, ashamed of their poverty. Folks wouldn't see them for months at a time. When they needed supplies, they sent a negro to town after them. The folks knew about it when Miss Cecilia came to live with them. She came from somewhere in the West Indies, where the whole family originally had its roots. A fine, handsome woman, they say, in the early thirties. But she didn't mix well with folks any more than the girls did. She brought a mulatto maid with her, and the Blassenville cruelty cropped out her treatment of this maid. A new old man, years ago, who swore he saw Miss Celia tie this girl up to a tree, stark naked, and whip her with a horsewhip. Nobody was surprised when she disappeared. Everybody figured she'd run away, of course. Well, one day in the spring of 1890, Miss Elizabeth, the youngest girl, came into town for the first time in maybe a year. She came after supplies, said the blacks had all left the place, talked a little more too, a bit wild, said Miss Celia had gone without leaving any word, said her sisters thought that she'd gone back to the West Indies, but she believed her aunt was still in the house. She didn't say what she meant, just got her supplies and pulled out for the manor. <sighs> Yeah, a month went past, and a black came into town and said that Miss Elizabeth was living at the manor alone, said her three sisters weren't there anymore, that they left one by one without giving any word or explanation. She didn't know where they'd gone, and was afraid to stay there alone, but didn't know where else to go. She'd never known anything but the manor, and had neither relatives nor friends, but she was in the mortal terror of something. The black said she locked herself in a room at night and kept candles burning all night. It was a stormy spring night when Miss Elizabeth came tearing into town on one horse she owned, nearly dead from fright. She fell from her horse in the square. When she could talk, she said she'd found a secret room in the manor that had been forgotten for a hundred years. And she said that there she found her three sisters, dead and hanging by their necks from the ceiling. She said something chased her and nearly brained her with an ax as she ran out from the front door. But somehow, she got to the horse and got away. She was nearly crazy with fear and didn't know what it was that chased her. Said it looked like a woman with a yellow face. About a hundred men rode out there right away. They searched the house from top to bottom, but they didn't find any secret room or the remains of the sisters. But they did find a hatchet sticking in the door jam downstairs, with some of Miss Elizabeth's hair stuck on it, just as she said. She said she wouldn't go back there and show them how to find the secret door. Almost went crazy when they suggested it. When she was able to travel, the people made up some money and loaned it to her. She was still too proud to accept charity, and she went to California. She never came back. But later it was learned, when she sent back to repay the money they'd loaned her, that she'd married out there. Nobody ever bought the house. It stood there, just as she left it. And as the years passed, folks stole all the furnishings out of it. Poor white trash, I reckon. Negro wouldn't go about it. But they came after sunup, and left long before sundown. What did the people think about Miss Elizabeth's story? Asked Griswell. Well, most folks thought she'd gone a little crazy living in that old house alone. But some people believed that mulatto girl, Joan, didn't run away after all. They believed she'd hidden in the woods and glutted her hatred of the Blassenvilles by murdering Miss Celia and the three girls. They beat up the woods with bloodhounds but never found a trace of her. If there was a secret room in the house, she might have been hiding there, if there was anything to that theory. She could have been hiding there all these years, muttered Griswell. Anyway, the thing in the house now isn't human. 
Buckner wrenched the wheel around and turned into a dim trace that left the main road and meandered off through the pines. Where are you going? There's an old negro that lives off this way, a few miles. I want to talk to him. We're up against something that takes more than white man sense. The black people know more than we do about some things. This old man is nearly a hundred years old. His master educated him when he was a boy, and after he was freed, he traveled more extensively than most white men do. They say he's a voodoo man. Griswell shivered at the phrase, staring uneasily at the green forest walls that shut them in. The scent of the pines was mingled with the odors of the unfamiliar plants and blossoms, but underlying all that was a reek of rot and decay. Again, the sick abhorrence of these dark, mysterious woodlands almost overpowered him. Voodoo, he muttered. I'd forgotten about that. I never could think of black magic in connection with the South. To me, witchcraft was always associated with old crooked streets and waterfront towns overhung by gabled roofs that were old when they were hanging witches in Salem. Dark, musty alleys where black cats and other things might steal at night. <sighs> witchcraft always meant the old towns of New England to me. But all this is more terrible than any New England legend. These somber pines, old deserted houses, lost plantations, mysterious black people, old tales of madness and horror. God, what a frightful ancient terrors there are on this continent fools call young. Here's old Jacob's hut, announced Buckner, bringing the automobile to a halt. Griswell saw a clearing in a small cabin squatting under the shadows of the huge trees. The pines gave way to oaks and cypresses, bearded with gray trailing moss, and behind the cabin lay the edge of a swamp that ran away under the dimness of the trees, choked with rank vegetation. A thin wisp of blue smoke curled up from the stick and mud chimney. He followed Buckner to the tiny stoop where the sheriff pushed open the leather hinged door and strode in. Griswell blinked in the comparative dimness of the interior. A single small window let in a little daylight. An old negro crouched beside the hearth, watching a pot stew over the open fire. He looked up as they entered, but did not rise. He seemed incredibly old. His face was a mass of wrinkles, and his eyes, dark and vital, were filmed momentarily at times, as if his mind wandered. Buckner motioned Griswell to sit down in a stringed bottom chair, and himself took a rudely made bench near the hearth, facing the old man. Jacob, he said bluntly, the time's come for you to talk. I know you know the secret of the Blassenville Manor. I've never questioned you about it, because it wasn't in my line. But a man was murdered there last night, and this man here may hang for it. "'unless you tell me what haunts the old house at the Blassenvilles.' "'The old man's eyes gleamed. "'They grew misty as if clouds of extreme age drifted across his brittle mind. "'The Blassenvilles,' he murmured, "'and his voice was mellow and rich, "'his speech not the patois of the piney woods darky. "'They were proud people, sirs, proud and cruel. "'Some died in the war.' Some were killed in duels, the men folks, sirs. Some died in the manor, the old manor. His voice trailed off into unintelligible mumblings. What of the manor? asked Buckner patiently. Miss Celia was the proudest of them all, the old man muttered. The proudest and the cruelest. The black people hated her. Joan, most of all. Joan had white blood in her. And she was proud, too. Miss Celia whipped her like a slave. What is the secret of Blassenville Manor? persisted Buckner. The film faded from the old man's eyes. They were dark as moonlit wells. What secret, sir? I do not understand. Oh, yes, you do. For years that old house has stood there with its mystery. You know the key to its riddle. The old man stirred the stew. He seemed perfectly rational now. Sir, life is sweet, 
even to an old black man. You mean, somebody would kill you if you told me? But the old man was mumbling again, his eyes clouded. Not somebody, no human, no human being. The black gods of the swamps. My secret is inviolate, guarded by the big serpent, the god above all gods. He would send a little brother to kiss me with his cold lips, a little brother with a white crescent moon on his head. I sold my soul to the big serpent when he made me at the maker of Zavembis. Buckner stiffened. I heard that word once before, he said softly, from the lips of a dying black man when I was a child. What does it mean? Fear filled the eyes of old Jacob. What have I said? No, no, I said nothing. Zavembis, prompted Buckner. Zavembis, mechanically repeated the old man, his eyes vacant. A Zavembi was once a woman on the slave coast they know of him. The drums that whisper by nights in the hills of Haiti tell of them. The makers of Zavembis are honored of the people of Dembala. It is death to speak of it to a white man. It is one of the snake gods' forbidden secrets. You speak of the Zavembis, said Buckner softly. I must not speak of it, mumbled the old man, and Griswell realized that he was thinking aloud, too far gone in his dotage to be aware that he was speaking at all. No white man must know that I danced in the back ceremony of the voodoo and was a maker of zombies and zavembis. The big snake punishes loose tongues with death. A zavembi is a woman? prompted Buckner. Was a woman, the old Negro muttered. She knew I was a maker of zavembis. She came and stood in my hut and asked for the awful brew, the brew of ground snake bones and the blood of vampire bats and the dew from night hawk's wings and other elements unnameable. She had danced in the black ceremonies. She was ripe to become a Zavambi. The black brew was all that was needed, and the other was beautiful. I could not refuse her. Who? demanded Buckner, tensely, but the old man's head was sunk on his withered breast, and he did not reply. He seemed to slumber as he sat. Buckner shook him. You gave a brew to make a woman a Zavambi? What is a Zavambi? The old man stirred resentfully and muttered drowsily. A Zavambi is no longer human. It knows neither relatives nor friends. It's one with the people of the black world. It commands the natural demons, owls, bats, snakes, werewolves. It can fetch darkness to blot out a little light. It can be slain by lead or steel, but unless it is slain, thus it lives forever. It eats no such food as humans eat. It dwells like a bat in a cave or an old house. Time means not to the Zavembi. An hour, a day, a year, all is one. It cannot speak human words, nor think as a human thinks but it can hypnotize the living by the sound of its voice. And when it slays a man, it can command its lifeless body until the flesh is cold. As long as the blood flows, the corpse is its slave. Its pleasure lies in the slaughter of human beings. And why should one become a Zavembi? asked Buckner softly. Hate whispered the old man. Hate! Revenge! Was her name Joan? murmured Buckner. It was as if the name penetrated the fogs of senility that clouded the voodoo man's mind. He shook himself, and the film faded from his eyes, leaving them hard and gleaming as wet black marble. Joan? he said slowly. I have not heard that name for the span of a generation. I seem to have been sleeping, gentlemen. 
I do not remember. I ask your pardon. Old men fall asleep before the fire like old dogs. You asked me of Blassonville Manor? Sir, if I were to tell you why I cannot answer you, you would deem it mere superstition. Yet the white man's God, being my witness, as he spoke, he was reaching across the hearth for a piece of firewood, groping among the heaps of sticks there and his voice broke in a scream as he jerked back his arm convulsively. And a horrible, thrashing, trailing thing came with it. Around the voodoo man's arm, a mottled length of that shape was wrapped, and a wicked wedge-shaped head struck again in silent fury. The old man fell on the hearth, screaming, upsetting the simmering pot and scattering the embers. And then Buckner caught up a billet of firewood and crushed that flat head, cursing. He kicked aside the nodding, twisting trunk, glaring briefly at the mangled head. Old Jacob had ceased screaming and writhing. He lay still, staring glassily upward. Dead? whispered Griswell. Dead as Judas is Cariot, snapped Buckner, frowning at the twitching reptile. That infernal snake crammed enough poison into his veins to kill a dozen men his age, but I think it was the shock and fright that killed him. What shall we do? asked Griswell, shivering. Leave the body on that bunk. Nothing can hurt it. If we bolt the door so the wild hogs can't get in, or any cat, we'll carry it into town tomorrow. We've got work to do tonight. Let's get going. Griswell shank from touching the corpse, but he helped Buckner lift it onto the rude bunk, then stumbled hastily out of the hut. The sun was hovering above the horizon, visible in dazzling red flame through the black stems of the trees. They climbed into the car in silence and went bumping back along the stumpy terrain. He said that the big snake would send one of his brothers, muttered Griswell. Nonsense, snorted Buckner. Snakes like warmth, and that swamp is full of them. It crawled in and coiled up among that firewood, and old Jacob disturbed it and it bit him. Nothing supernatural about it. After a short silence, he said in a different voice, That was the first time I ever saw a rattler strike without singing, and the first time I ever saw a snake with a white crescent moon on its head. They were turning into the main road before either spoke again. You think that that mulatto, Joan, had skulked in the house all these years? Griswell asked. You heard what old Jacob said, answered Buckner grimly. Time means nothing to a Zavimbi. As they made the last turn in the road, Griswell braced himself against the side of Blassenville Manor looming black against the red sunset. When it came into view, he bit his lip to keep from shrieking. The suggestion of cryptic horror came back in all its power. Look, he whispered from dry lips as they came to a halt beside the road. Buckner grunted. From the balustrades of the gallery rose a whirling cloud of pigeons that swept away into the sunset, black against the lurid player. Who likes dark stories? People have experienced a touch of the dark side, and people who are a little wiser to the world. People who like their bones chilled and their spines tingled. People like you and me. It's hard to find a story these days that right on the dark side with a touch of whimsy, humor, and heart. Mav Sky spreads her dark wings and solves this problem for you. Head on over to Amazon and type Mav Sky's name into the search engine, M-A-V-S-K-Y-E. At Amazon, you'll find her Tales to Chill Your Bone series, Girl Clown Hatchet series, and Supergirl series. Snatch up Mav's cult classic novel, Wanted Single Rose, or her brand new release, Cold Hangs the Midnight. Choose your dark flavor and head on over to Amazon today. 
or visit her website at www.darksoftlytales.com. You can also friend Mav at Twitter with the handle at darksoftlytales. Be sure to tweet hello. Hello.